before we start, I wanted to share a quick background on Farm to School BC. So Farm to School BC is a program that brings healthy, local, and sustainable food into schools across British Columbia. We provide students with hands-on learning opportunities that develop food literacy, and we strengthen the local food system by striving to enhance school and community connectedness. Farm to School BC is a program of the Public Health Association of BC and supported by the province of BC. <laughs> um, here is a map, thanks Jessa, of our eight regional hubs across British Columbia. Our regional hubs are coordinated by our local community animators and supported by networks of stakeholders that are located nearby. Uh, if you don't see your district you're associated with on this map, please don't worry, we're here to support you. Uh, our organization is still growing and just with the capacity we have, we'll just try to connect you to the nearest animator to you. And there are a few animators on the call today. If you want to get a, like a wave or an emoji or a little like fist bump, thanks. Great, thanks. Okay, thanks, Tessa. And so we're settling into this fourth workshop, like Tessa was saying, and here's an overview of the year ahead. For those who attended last year, you'll find that the workshop themes are very like quite similar to, to the previous seasons, but for this series, we're focusing on the guest speakers a lot more and the unique knowledge and expertise that they bring. So they are going to be your mentors on this guide and Tessa and I are facilitators to this journey. Um, and we're also just going to slip into a longer Q&A session to provide more opportunities for tailored discussions. So now that we're thinking of May, since we're partway through April, uh, our May workshop is gonna be looking at the essentials of summer maintenance and volunteer management as we think about transitioning out of the school year. And there should be a registration link for you to access if you feel keen on that topic right now. But today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what and when to plant uh, in the spring season in your school garden. And we're going to cover some great routines in the class, in the classroom when we're looking at it as the garden. Sorry, we're gonna cover routines in the garden classroom. Um, and then we're gonna do outdoor planting with students. We're going to talk about some signage and then we're gonna hear from our guest, Laura Lynn, who's really gonna bring all that together with a lot of lived experience. So speaking of lived experience, Laura Lynn has established this, the Colquitt's Middle School Learning Garden um, as of 2017. Wow, so that's that's a lot of years. Hold on, I'll get into the math. That's seven years. Wow, Laura, it's amazing. Um, the number of initiatives that Laura has spearheaded and contributed are, are bountiful, including the creation of a sustainable resources exploratory class at Colt Goods. And through this course, students got to plant, maintain, and harvest fresh fruits and vegetables. So Laura Lynn retired in June 2022, but continues to volunteer weekly in the garden and show up as a champion in lots of different ways, like coming today to our mentorship series. So thank you so much, Laura. Great, and before we get to Laura, um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about planning for planting and what are the questions that you want to ask yourself? So we're gonna go through maybe a couple tools to help you make these decisions about what you wanna be planting in your school garden. So before you get planting, we wanna make sure that we're having a little check-in with ourselves and managing our own expectations. Um, it's a great reminder for the expectations we have for the time in the garden, but also for teaching and learning in general. I think that as an educator myself, I don't always do these little like self check-ins and sometimes just taking that time to be present with, am I holding myself too high for like what I'm asking of both, uh, the environment and of myself as an educator and of myself of this season, just like taking a little moment to think twice about those. But after you're done having a little bit of check-in and self-reflection um, about the expectations of the experience, the following questions here are important as part of your planning with your colleagues before involving your students. So they can help you make a more refined decision. Um, and I'll just read through a couple of them that we have here. So like, what is your budget? for the plants and the seeds. If it was up to the kids, they would just plant everything. I'm not sure they're really aware of budgets, but it's actually a great exercise to think about as a classroom, but like as an adult, I'm like, okay, wait, what is our budget we can work with? Uh, what classes are going to actually be doing the planting? Who's gonna take care of the watering and weeding? 
um, which classes will harvest the food and then how would this food be shared and eaten? So how can we stretch out this experience to like our broader community? And Tessa and I were thinking how lovely these questions um, bring up the idea of backwards design where you're actually prioritizing the learning outcomes instead of the actual topics being covered. So as, as outdoor educators, um, yeah, I think we, we really enjoy that piece of, of these questions. And then you can go to the next slide, Tessa. Thank you. Um, and before you're planting, while you're planning, I just wanted to give a little shout out to this fabulous resource, which I have my copy of right here. Ta-da! This is the school garden curriculum. And my, we can see it there because my, my video is blurred. Sorry about that. But it, I, I really like this little excerpt. It's just a reminder of um, all the learning that can be happening at the time of year and how you can connect the seasonality of the garden with the seasonality of your curriculum. So there's a link to this resource. I really highly recommend checking it out. It's been really valuable for me in planning and just conceptualizing using my space within the curriculum. And another thing I love about um, this time of year is, is planning with calendars. I really love calendars. I own two hard calendars and one digital calendar. So this is like, this is my jam here. We're thinking about timelines and the calendars play a really important role in that. So it's a great place to even start thinking about math. Um, that that backwards design process is really integrated in here as well. How long is it going to take for this plant to get from seed to fruit? If we put the seeds in the ground at this time, when will we get them? When will we get to harvest them? Uh, what are we actually able to harvest in this springtime? And think about the ground and the weather. These times can fluctuate. Like when we're looking at this kind of crop planning guide, they can, they can fluctuate based on the area you're in and also just the conditions of your season. So these are just quite beautiful uh, because they've been formatted and adapted to different regions that we have here in BC. And these are being modeled a little bit off of um, popular charts you might see in seed catalog catalogs. I think of the one in the West Coast seeds catalog a lot. I see it often. So we developed this resource and it's, it's printable. It's on our website. Another resource that's on our website are the crop cards. So here's a sample of the crop cards that can be found on our website. We have the sets for the spring and the fall. They also have a really great activity on them. I like how they also, in my opinion, kind of mimic uh, an extension of a seed packet. So they're both um, relatable and also expansive because they have a fun activity there. And then I, just need to give a tiny little shout out to perennials. So even though we're thinking of the here and now of spring, it's also really good to think about the long-term planning for the springs to come in the school garden. So if you have a little bit of money in your budget, you can buy some established perennials like some of these here, um, or you can ask around to the grown-ups associated with your classroom or places like Facebook Marketplace are really great to find plants um, that people are donating or selling quite cheap at like a cheaper rate. So perennials are easier to maintain and you don't have to plant them every year. So some that I really like are uh, sorrel. There's a really tasty lemon variety. It's quite sour and like really fun for kids to experience that in their mouths. And then strawberries and rhubarb are lovely and happen to make the best pie filling together. Then a lot of our herbs are perennials. Um, and the, the beauty of perennials is they often support pollinators just in the longevity of their seasonal appearance. And lastly, when we're thinking of spring, one more time to think ahead is to think about the fall. We have, um, we have fall crop planting cards. And then we also want to incentivize folks to think about direct seeding some of these like carrots and winter squash. And then the potatoes are actually started to seed potatoes. Lots of ways to grow potatoes can be uh, really accessible too. You can grow them in pots, you can put them outside, you can keep them in your classroom. They're really quite fun to see all those eyes develop into something on the potatoes. Um, and tomatoes and peppers can be a little bit finicky, but you can get those from seedlings. They do require summer care and a lot of heat. If you have that available to you, I recommend taking a taking a go at those. And maybe, maybe not your first year, but you'll have some delicious fall bounty with either the peppers and the tomatoes. Great. Thanks, Tessa. Thank you, Sonia. I can still see one of my students' faces the first time they dug potatoes out of the ground. Like, 
whoa, mind blown that this is where potatoes came from. Um, yeah, these are so exciting. All those root crops are really neat to see. Um, kids wonder when they first come out of the ground. Um, but now that we've talked about planning, what you're going to grow and when you're going to plant it, it's now time to talk about how you're going to plant out in the garden while engaging 25 students that you have alongside you. Gardening with a class can feel chaotic, um, especially if teaching outside is something that new, that's new for you. So before we talk about the specifics of how to plant with students outside, we're going to talk more generally about some routines that can support outdoor learning in the classroom. Before working as a classroom teacher, I worked as an outdoor educator for a decade. And when I transitioned to classroom teaching, I naively just thought, oh, I'll bring my class outside and I'll see the same wonder and magic that I experienced as an outdoor teacher. Um, but I realized it's so different. When students are familiar with the boundaries and expectations of the classroom, it can be hard for them to know how to learn, how to behave, how to relate outside of the classroom. So I really um, believe in establishing routines, both for myself as a teacher and also for the students. And it helps me set up learning in the garden and turning the garden just as an outdoor space and set into an outdoor classroom where there's an expectation that we're working on learning in that space. I could fill an hour easily chatting about this, um, but instead of trying to overly abbreviate this topic, I'm going to direct you towards an amazing resource. Back in 2020, Farm to School BC hosted a webinar with two wonderful outdoor educators from an organization called Groundbreakers in Northern BC. And these two educators talk in depth about routines that they established to support learning outdoors and especially support learning in the classroom. I highly recommend this. I've watched it, I think, three times and I'm going to keep watching it because I always glean something new from it. And it really sets up um, how you can uh, create these routines to support learning in the outdoor classroom. Um, in addition to general routines for learning outdoors, there's also some routines that are more specific to garden environments. And establishing these routines in the gardens not only cuts down on your planning time, it also grows independence in the garden and can be a foundation to a station-based approach uh, to learning in the garden. So once you have these routines developed, uh, students are more able to work semi-independently in stations, which frees you up to work with a smaller group of students in a hands-on activity like seating. In last year's School Garden Mentorship Workshop in April, I talked through all these routines uh, in quite a bit of detail. I'm not going to do that today because we want to give lots of time to hear from Laura Lynn, um, but I, I'm just going to highlight a couple of my favorites that you might not have thought about. Um, so first of all, enter and exit routines. Whenever we're transitioning to learning a new learning space, we're often primed for this for teachers. And we think about it, like when we go into the gym, how are we gonna transition to that space? But sometimes we forget about that for the garden. So having those entrance routines, maybe it's a place that students put the supplies, an area where you gather, something that they're prompted to notice on their way in. Just think about how you're setting them up for entering that garden and ready to learn in that space. Another routine I wanna highlight is sensory tune-ins, also called sit spots in the outdoor education world. It's a really common practice um, in the outdoor ed world, but not always brought into the classroom environment. If you have a big garden, a sensory tune-in can be students just finding a solo spot and using their senses to tune into that environment around them. Um, but more often it works as a group sensory tune-in. A couple of ways I do this, sometimes with older students, if we're standing in a circle, especially during an opening or closing time, we just get all the students to look outside. So flip their body 180 degrees and face outside of the circle. And that gives them their own um, perspective and experience in the garden. And then I guide them through with some questions of sensory tune-in. Or with little learners, we like to lay on our bellies in the garden, have our nose right up to the grass and see what we can see and then flip over onto our backs and look up at the sky and tune into the garden that way. Um, one other one I wanna highlight, um, which is actually an idea that came through a couple of years ago at School Garden Mentorship, um, is this idea of weed of the week. And I love it. Weeds are really fun to highlight. Uh, it kind of puts a new spin on weeding. Often when you tell students, we're going to go weeding, there's like groans. It's not often kids' favorite activity in the garden. Uh, but when you learn a bit more about the weeds, which ones are edible? What's their story? How do they come to be in the garden? Um, it can really bring a new light to weeding and a lot to learn in there as well. The last two highlight on that list, I just want to share a couple photos with. Scavenger hunts um, are a really great way to engage kids to get them exploring, touring the garden. Uh, I've used egg cartons in the past, as you can see in the photo on the right there, with a visual cue up top to help the younger learners uh, identify which things go in each spot. Uh, you can also use paint chips or colored rocks. Um, someone mentioned that they loved just playing a scavenger hunt where students find a color that matches the color that they're wearing on their bodies at that time. Uh, or evidence of an animal or something that smells really good or really bad. So coming up with fun different scavenger hunt questions each time. It doesn't need to be a big fun event. It can just be a way to encourage them to explore more deeply. Um, Spex also puts out a great seasonal scavenger hunt, and we'll put a link to that. 
Um, one other routine I just want to talk about is the journaling uh, routine and journaling observation stations can take many different forms, but I want to take a moment to highlight one activity that I like for scaffolding journaling. I like to teach students about scientific drawing and I use the ABCs of scientific drawing as a quick, easy tool to communicate and remember criteria for scientific drawing. And I find students get really into this and it's an easy criteria. They can go back and check their work and say, did I include all these steps? Um, and I just put a link uh, to a slideshow that I used when I was teaching this um, that just helps uh, students engage in that. Um, so, those are general garden routines in general, and I want to focus specifically on uh, spring in the garden now. So many of the activities we do in the spring uh, focus around planting seeds and planting seedlings. The actual planting of seeds can be a really quick experience, and so I recommend doing some related activities in the couple of weeks leading up to it. These priming activities help build the student engagement and investment of the process and helps them become more attached to the seeds once they're planted and stewarding them along. So there's a few suggestions on here. There's a picture of some of my students painting signs. I really like doing that as a way to connect and a way of bringing out those more artsy students to connect into the garden space. There's a planting ruler there, um, studying seeds, observing them indoors. There's lots of ways you can connect before you actually get to that day of seeding. But once you're there and it's time to plant outside, similar to what Sonia was saying around checking expectations, I like to ask myself the question, am I planting seeds today to have a product of a successful harvest in June? Or am I planting seeds today for a process so that students are engaged in experiencing the feeling of the dirt, looking at seeds, and what goes along with putting those seeds in the soil? So really matching your expectations with your circumstances. Maybe you have enough volunteers to support a really successful <laughs> seeding so you do have that product in June, or maybe it's more about the experience. Uh, either way, I find the station-based approach can work really well. And here's some examples of how I, you could plan out those stations. So you're at a planting station with a few students, and then students are in semi-independent uh, stations doing other activities that are also supporting the planting. Um, last year, I went into depth about each of these stations. So feel free to check out last year recording if you're wanting more support for that. Um, but I will just mention at the planting station, a couple tips and tricks. Uh, have your labels made up ahead of time. It's intuitive to plant seeds and then be like, wait, where did that go? Where do I put the label? Put the label in first it can really help. Uh, you can use string lines or meter sticks to help you plant in straight lines if that's what you're wanting. I recommend taking the seeds out of the seed envelopes, uh, like little muddy wet hands and seed envelopes make the mess really quickly. I love this picture of a muffin tray because I think that that can really help divide them up. Um, you can use the end of a eraser, a end of a the eraser on the end of a pencil to poke the holes. It's a really nice depth for a lot of seeds. Um, and another option with tiny seeds is sometimes I mix them first with students in peat moss and then I actually plant the peat moss. Um, which helps us. things like carrots. It actually disperses them, provides a great growing medium, and the students love stirring up the seeds into the peat moss before we plant. So those are just a couple tips and tricks, but we go into this in more detail last year. So if you're curious for more information, check out last year's recording. And I'm gonna hand it over to Sonia to talk a little bit about signage before we pass it over to Laura Lynn. Thank you, Tessa. Ooh, whirlwind. Um, one little quote that I gleaned from Kaylin from last year was the, smaller the hand, the bigger the seed. So I thought that was like a really helpful reminder of like, okay, don't give pre-K and kindergarten kids carrot seeds, maybe. I don't know, unless they're mixed in with that medium. Love it. Um, so I just wanted to talk to you for a couple moments about signage and the value of the signage as a tool for communication and also for relationship building. In addition to it serving as a purpose to get to know our spaces and also giving us maybe some boundaries in that space we're trying to create. So here are some reasons for signage in the garden. Uh, we're really looking at managing expectations of the messaging. First, we wanna make sure we're managing our own expectations again. And it's a good lesson for time in the garden in general, but also just for our signage. So we could be looking at signage as a tool for communication, identification, connections to community, like storytelling, helps with management and organization, um, a way to see personal touches from students. Like students love to see themselves in the garden and like why not do that through art or an expression and signage. And also it connects everyone to the space. If it's more personalized and more relatable, we're gonna feel a little bit more accountable to take care of it. So one great way to use signage is to try to uh, remind folks uh, to invite them to follow the rules and the conduct of the garden. Before entering the garden, it can be really important to establish those rules and guiding principles while in the space. 
Uh, I've really seen some successful examples of teachers who draft these rules with their student input and, and pause at the garden before entering. And I think you could also create these rules in the classroom. When you're thinking about setting expectations for the beginning of your year in the classroom, you can think about setting those expectations in the classroom and then taking them outside and representing them somehow in the garden. Um, and then also we want to think about identifying zones in the garden. This is a great form of signage that you can also have in your school or you could put out into a newsletter. You could share this, this form of signage. Maps can be a great way for students to develop a sense of belonging in the garden, but they're also great at um, for communication and co-management among classes themselves, especially if you've got many classes visiting that site. And then you can also print them out. Um, and I, I really think it'd be fun to send them home too for the rest of the community to see. And then we don't want to forget about informative signs. So not only are they enriching for those nerds like myself who want to know the Latin name and the species, but they can be a way to connect to different cultural foods and traditional uses of plants. Like I mentioned before, it's really valuable for students to just see themselves like in their foods if they can. And that also includes their cultural heritage. And then I really like this slide because our signs could just be an independent station. If you're setting up stations in the classroom during your teaching time, let the sign do the explaining for you and make it a expanded ADST lesson perhaps you want to look at constructing and painting signs there's lots of ways to bring that into your curriculum this is a beautiful lesson that's showcased in the learning from the land toolkit that farm to school bc helped put together I really recommend checking it out you can download yourself a copy it's gorgeous and then don't forget to liven up your shed and lock it up so this is actually I believe, Laura Lynn, this is your shed, is it not? Yeah, okay, Laura Lynn. Um, one of the best ways to detract vandalism and theft is to actually do it through communication and be a little bit proactive. So use the signs to tell the story of who the garden is for. They can be sometimes a site of vandalism, but we want to think about how students can put a personal touch on it. And we don't want to forget to lock up the shed. So consider um, different ways to lock up the shed. I have a little picture here of this combo lock. And then also Tess and I were talking about a lock box with a key inside might be a really great way to lock it up. Okay, so we know that our garden can build relationships. And I think I want to just use this slide to segue right into introducing Laura Lynn. Um, we have Laura Lynn today as our guest speaker. And we wanted to let her introduce herself with her whole face. But from what I know, you've been really pivotal in establishing the school, this Colquitt's Middle School uh, Learning Garden. You have been engaged in so many projects. So um, it's my pleasure to have you here, Laura Lynn. And let us know what we can do for you. The floor is yours. Probably unmute myself is a good idea. Um, so yeah, we might as well just start with the first slide. It was funny because that whole garden um, shed one, I'm like, oh, I didn't get that garden shed sign. So are we going to, yeah, just see the first one? Yeah. Sorry, Lolan, I'm just getting back to your slide. Yeah, I thought I, I had it set up there, but it's coming back. Here we go. Ah, yeah, there it is. So this just the first one, and this is where we are today. So the second one is probably the next one to go to. So if you if you don't recognize this this wonderful little fruit, it's the ground cherries or golden berries, or sometimes they're called gooseberries. And when you buy them in the store, they're actually uh, from like Colombia, but we can grow them here in our own garden. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But I am going to talk about more about signage more about some of the spring crops that uh, were, you know, going to be planted, um, some of the garden routines I had, and uh, some of the classroom management techniques, and and some tips and tricks on seedling and, and transplanting. So next slide. So you can see this is kid art on the right, and then the help them garden was my retirement gift, the sign there. Oh, maybe go back, Tessa. And uh, so it's placed high on the shed to avoid uh, any vandalism. Um, and uh, so I've got a few other sort of signage things and you could go to the next one now. So I painted this and Marcus, I, I wanted this up for when we had an event there and I don't think this was up or out, but um, this was all kid calligraphy and they painted it. And it says, you know, farm to school, hands-on learning opportunities and healthy local 
uh, food for students and staff and community connections. So that's kind of the three pillars. And on the other side, that farm to school is a win-win-win for students, farmers, and communities. Uh, our farm to school program, the bi-weekly and then a weekly lunch program was established in 2013. Um, and you can see the garden in 2017. And subsequently, the farm to school lunch program has not flourished, but we're hoping to make a bit of a comeback. So I can answer more questions about that, but we, we, we'll talk more about just planting right now. So next slide, please. So we did uh, as an exploratory. So maybe I should go back. It's a middle school and I was an exploratory teacher. So I taught all 525 students and we uh, had about six to eight weeks together uh, with uh, five different classes and then we moved on. So in the winter are times when there's not so much to do in the garden, we do some other things like uh, some mosaics. And uh, so these were done quite a few years ago, but they are failing. The one on the left says garlic and there's garlic there. Um, and we have quite a bit of garlic at the, at the school. Um, and because it has probably 10 hours of sun a day, um, it, we get big garlic. And the one on the right, I'm not sure, I think that might've said basil at one time, but it's uh, kind of all the little bits are falling out, but they still look kind of nice. So maybe next slide, please. And uh, a cheap way to make some plant tags on the top, it says kale. So kids have painted these is a dollar store. And I think it's Dollarama that uh, for $4, you get 35 different little spikes and then they're bamboo. So they're quite hardy and the kids can uh, paint them up. And you'll see in the next uh, slide that they, on the right, the kids have painted those and they, they were done last year. So they may or may not last a couple of years. You can see this one piece of, um, uh, a sign is sort of delaminating. I think it was a little bit of um, a plywood. So those aren't really the best, we need solid wood. And then on the left, the uh, black plastic uh, with the um, marker, they last quite a long time and, uh, and so they work. And so some of the spring crops, um, and again, it's now dictated by that we aren't cooking so much food. So, um, we aren't planting things that normally we, we might have uh, cooked, um, the beets or broccoli or, or um, I guess cabbage, but that we were never super successful on those things anyways. Um, so this spring we always get calendula and nasturtium and borage. They're the edible flowers and kids love to eat those. Um, there's the other, yeah, because they somehow got into, they get into the compost and you have to manage to, to not have so much of them. Um, but borage, if you don't know it, the, one of the last slides has got a beautiful photo of it. And it's just a, a pollinator magnet. Their bees are on it all the time. And then some of the other ones we have around the outside of the school is lupins and columbine and tulips. And, and we have a flowering red currant in the garden. And we have quite a bit of perennials. There is asparagus and uh, raspberries, strawberries, huscup, rhubarb, and then lots of different herbs, the mint oregano. And there's a couple other herbs, chives and parsley we also have, I forgot to mention there. Um, the overwintering, the purple sprouting broccoli uh, the bro um, and kale and garlic um, are there right now in the garden. And there's some photos coming up. Um, and then we've just uh, planted the snow peas um, and some radishes, the carrots are coming, um, and, um, and potatoes are inside right now. It's kind of the idea of the spuds and tubs program. I've got some photos of that. The tomatoes will be coming along. Uh, they're not ready yet. And beans a little bit later and basil, of course, later. And the lettuce is going, it's being seeded inside right now. We've got we have lots of mixed greens. And then I said those ground cherries or golden berries. And that is a photo of the asparagus coming up in the garden right now. And kids, you can top it off and kids will eat it raw. Yeah, so thank you. Yes, yeah. So in, if you are growing purple sprouting broccoli, uh, the one the photo on the left is the photo on the right. And you just break off that center little um, crown and then all of those other little uh, sprouts will come along. And, uh, and I've had, grade eight kids running into the garden out of the PE class saying, can I have some of that purple sprouting broccoli? And you go, okay, uh, but then go back to PE. And so um, 
it, you know, they love it and, and they like it. So it's, it's a, it's a good one to grow and you plant it in the summer and then it'll grow through the fall. Yeah. So next slide. We've got quite a few berries. So also in the background of the photo on the right, you can see those um, are ferro cement planters that we have our orchards in. And it's kind of nice because you can see that we have deer fencing, which doesn't look as a, you know, sort of as, as a wall, like the chain link fence. So I would encourage you if you can get deer fencing, it's quite nice. Um, these are uh, golden raspberries um, right ahead and they are ever bearing. And the golden ones are sweeter. It's actually quite amazing. And the kids love them. And uh, um, at first they don't think they're ripe yet, but they, they are, they go quite a, quite an orangey golden color. And we had them coming through right on the outside of the fence so people could pick them. And the Haskup or, or honeyberry are kind of like a blueberry, a longer, thinner one, and you, but you need a male and a female plant. So we have both on the left. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, and there's just a photo of our, our purpose brought broccoli. It was everywhere right after spring break. And uh, so um, some of the garden routines I would suggest is you really need to get help. Um, and uh, I was able to find lots of wonderful volunteers. Um, and some of them found me, Leslie that's on this call. And, uh, and even Peter came, the waterman is on the call too. He, he came out and helped for a little bit. I, f I would find people in markets or people from the Victoria Horticulture Society or wherever, um, seniors, neighbors, master gardeners. Um, it really is nice if you can find more caring adults and then if they are willing to come on a regular basis every week or two, um, it, then the same kids get to work with the same people. And um, my own father-in-law uh, was an agriculture uh, major and he, once he retired, uh, he worked at the UBC farm as a farm friends. And he did that for five years from 82 years old to 86 years old. And he lived to 102, just passing away a couple of months ago. So the moral is keep uh, keep moving. And uh, I think a lot of seniors would love to work with kids, but they don't even know how or how you know that they're invited to. Um, so I would I divide the group into two or three or four, you know, whatever many groups of, of adults you have, and uh, and then they can work with a small group. Um, I would pick have them, I had them pick their teammates so that they would be more fun for them and they would stay with the group. But if they weren't following the expectations, then I invited them to a different group, usually mine. So thank you. Um, classroom management. Um, I would actually, at the beginning of the class, get kids to write down these expectations. And the, you know, one of the big ones was keeping hands, uh, feet and objects to yourself always. Middle school kids tend to be a little more rambunctious and, uh, you know, just bigger um, and so much energy. Uh, I, you know, actually, if you could tap that, we wouldn't need another uh, energy source. We could just hook them up. But anyway, um, garden tools, are, you know, are obviously sharp. And these, I, I kind of suggest to them that these are not Barbie tools. These are like real sharp, you know, proper sized tools. And you are a, a bubble of blood, so do not... Uh, pierce that. Um, so you need space around you to make sure that you're you're safe and everybody else is safe. Um, and that the garden is really an outdoor classroom. This is uh, not a free for all. I would, I'd never let them go over to the playground when I, you know, we were supposed to be in the garden because I didn't want that habit. I would let them just sit in the garden and observe because um, that is doing something. Um, if they needed a break, they could sit there. We do have chickens uh, again in the garden and they love watching the chickens. Um, and I would have them, you know, teach them how to handle and carry and pro properly use the tools, demonstrate it, have them practice. Um, it's really something, you know, you have to keep reminding them. Um, and the whole idea of never stepping on the face of the garden, I kind of would say, who wants to lie down and have some your friend walk over your face? Um, and of course, they, you know, they'll try not to gush out your eye or step, break your nose, but no one would suggest that. So, you know, walking on the paths only and sort of describing how the soil has, you know, so much um, air, space and water. Um, stay with the group. Again, they, they, wherever your group is, you need to be there. 
and just listen and, and speak respectfully. So some of those we wrote down and, and reminded them of those routines. Um, this is something that I wasn't didn't uh, know in the beginning that I'd have to teach kids this, but it makes sense. Um, you do need to teach them how to cradle and and especially in the, if you have the six cell um, plants, you need to sort of squish out and hold and cradle those so their necks are safe, um, so that you don't don't break and smash your little seedlings. Um, and especially if you're growing them yourself, sometimes they're not quite as solid as this, and they're a little bit floppy, um, but that's you know something uh, to to teach them. Side. Um, this is something we learned the hard way. We um, one time planted all this this uh, stuff out, and then came back you know, two days later. Or I guess we planted Friday and came back Monday, and there was nothing there. And it's like, what happened to it? And I think uh, there's some birds pecked away at it and ate all our little seedlings. Um, so these little lacy covers help uh, with Plant, transplant shock um, and but they still let in light and water um, and then another thing that's important if you are growing your own seedlings to make sure that you harden them off so that you're putting them outside in the day and then bringing them back in at night and and doing that for you know a few days um, because otherwise the um, wind and, and sun can really do a number on little plants okay slide and, and so then when we started planting um, out and we often plant right along the drip line, um, we started marking it and we've used various um, things, but these are free. I put them through the dishwasher and, um, and they came from the, the lunch program. And um, that way, you know, if you've got seeds there, but where, where things are gonna come up and no one over double plants on it um, or, you know, so that, it just is a help to remember what you've got going on. Thank you. Um, on last week, I had um, grown the snow peas or snap peas um, in vermiculite, uh, started on a heat pad and they grew quite tall over spring break. Um, I got kids at Keating Elementary that I was working with to separate out their little roots and you can see it in the tray. Um, and then we planted them out and there's another photo there. Next one. Um, we have something here um, that most of you probably don't have. We have lizards. And the lizards grazed off all of the sunflowers I'd started to plant. Matter of fact, I, there's a photo later I'll show you. I don't know what ate it, but um, so we opted to keep them in the plastic pots. And this this is a teepee shape and we've put this netting around it. Um, they will have to hand water these uh, snap peas through to, to June. And then anything they don't um, water, uh, it will just become seeds for next year um, when it dries. But uh, so we had kids planting all these peas in these pots. Thanks. Um, if you plant carrots or radishes, you'll never find those plant starts because they they uh, that is the root is uh, the edible part. And so you need to start them in paper pots. Lee Valley has a little machine you can use to for $20 to create them or you can use a mason jar or you can buy these. These I think were just bought at the dollar store, these biodegradable pots. Um, you can see the kids are starting to plant them on the left. And I purposely put this one on the right because that is not deep enough to plant them. You can see that you can see the edge of the pot and it'll wick away the uh, moisture. They'll dry out too much. And I didn't take, didn't put in the next photo where you can break down the edge of the pot or you can cover it up um, right up to the edge so that um, this, the soil will be right around the seedlings and they won't uh, dry out. So radish. Um, there is a spuds and tubs program if you're lucky enough to get in on it. Um, they will provide the soil and the warba potato starts and a bunch of information. Um, I I did that for years and years, um, but I wanted to do it at Keating. And so we just went and bought the uh, sea soil and bought the plant starts and started them inside over spring break. So you can see these are planted March 12th. And now it's right after spring break, whatever that uh, 23 days later was um, and this is how much they've come up and you um, 
leave them in a south window. You can see it's sort of floor to ceiling door there window. Uh, you hill them up by adding carefully more soil all around them in the uh, leaving the lowest one uh, not covered up. And then warbas can be harvested in June. We usually oven roast them um, with the class that it's hard because at Keating we had five classes plant and five classes um, harvest. Um, and then everybody got just a tiny cup of a few potatoes, but uh, you harvest by putting them down on a tarp and flipping them upside down like a sandcastle and then hunting for the little golden nuggets. And then we used to count them all, sort them by size and, uh, and wash them and, and eat them. So the kids really love this. It's a super easy thing to do. And then you don't leave them in the garden. It's so hard when you um, are, you know, you've planted them right in the garden to find them all. And then also to keep them hilled up enough without having them go green because they're exposed to the sun. Okay, next slide. So watering um, seedlings, kids are kind of sometimes not great with watering. They crash things down. But this little um, mister on the left, it was, I think I got it at Country Grocer. So it's just like a grocery store and you pump it up and it sprays. It's quite a nice spray. And those are some other radishes. And then um, the one on the right is just a little fixture on a, um, a pop bottle or a water bottle. Uh, I've got another photo of it next. Um, and it just makes a nice little stream. And the one on the right is, or just, sorry, go back. Um, the one on the right is uh, is just bunching onions. And I had two bags of them. And these are just those fabric bags. This is in my own home. Half of them got grazed off on Sunday. I do not know what ate them, but because it wasn't a plastic pot, it could have been the lizards, the European invasive wall lizards, um, which there is a lot here and also at Keating. Um, it could have been birds, it could have been a rabbit, but I didn't think so. I don't think rabbits eat onions. So I don't know what ate them. I don't think it wasn't slugs because they were just totally grazed off above the uh, soil line. I don't think it was that. Um, anyway, so um, I just like it when other, the world we share. <laughs> <laughs> my food anyway if you go to the next slide um so these are the two things you can see it's a pretty simple i think lee valley have four of those little tips and uh, i wouldn't put all for all at once you'll probably lose them so just maybe two at a time um if you're getting kids to use them and then there's the spray bottle and um i highly suggest you get an irrigation system uh because it's just you know there's not enough time in the day to hand water in the summer uh Keating has a overhead emitter system and I'm trying to turn it to drip line system because it's way more efficient uh, for the beds. It doesn't water the pathways where all the weeds are. And so we're trying to convert that over. And these are two references for um, uh, that I use. The, the, this is the, the book, the Guru book, the Linda Gilkinson's book. Um, uh, yeah, it's usually start reading sometime in January again. Every January, we sort of look through it again. And then I don't know if you know Jordan Marr. Uh, he has, uh, uh, he's got this little YouTube thing that you can go on. He's got some nice newsletters and, and little videos he makes. And he talks all about plant babies and how to do it. It's quite nice. And I think that's maybe it. Do I have one more slide? Oh, there was a thank you slide with my... Oh. Yeah, the last slide, which had something else I wanted to show you on it. I think a photo of something. Oh, the it's book. Coming up. Perfect. Yeah, the next one. last one. Oh, the board. Board. <laughs> Yeah, and so this you can pull those little um, blue flowers off and you decorate cakes with them. And you know, I'm surprised if some don't have bees on it because usually there's bees everywhere. So there you go. Thank you That's so much. That's a beautiful Laura photo, Laura Lynn. Oh. Yeah, I, Laura Lynn, I also put forage flowers in ice cube trays and make fancy mocktails with them. Oh. Like I find them quite beautiful in like a summer drink. So, wow, Laura Lynn, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And um, I have lots of questions, but I, I will take, we have about 13 minutes. So I would love to just see if folks um, have any questions. And I see one from Lori. Can you think of a reference for those of us who are further north, like in Vanderhoof? That's a great question. Um, Laura Lynn? Um, I personally don't know um, other ones because uh, that is quite far north. I'm sorry. Yes. I, maybe Linda Gilkinson, if you, you, there is a, 
you might be able to contact her and she might know a friend mm. up there that are working. She is an entomologist by training, but she's a garden guru. Yeah. And Lori, if you want to put your, if you're comfy putting your contact information out there um, or to me personally, I can pass it along to our animator and Prince George. So uh, Roanne would be more familiar with just the seasonal resources up there. So feel free to send me a message and I'll take note of that. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks, Lori. Any other questions from folks or comments? Fascinating feedback. Oh, good. <laughs> I, oh, I was going to say, I thought of something else. The um, the garden scavenger hunt, I've used um, the egg cartons. And on the bottom, um, I've had uh, two contrasting things and every you know, six different groups and every group has a different one. And, you know, it could be brown and green and they have to get six things that are on each side or, you know, sharp and smooth or rough and prickly or round and flat or, and, and then they have to, try and figure out what the person's looked for. And then I get them to report out on what do you think theirs is. And it's actually quite fun. Um, and it really gets them looking all around the garden. And uh, so that's one of the ones I saw. I love that, Laura. I've done a lot of scavenger hunts and I haven't thought of that. And I'm excited to try that out. Thanks mm. for sharing that. This is this is a really great question. Um, Sorry, Tessa, I didn't mean to interrupt you there. I'm just, Shauna, hi, nice to see you here. Um, Shauna has a great question. When when you experience loss in the garden, how do you frame it when explaining it to kids? It's indeed a common theme. And I often say that being a gardener is learning how to deal with disappointment. It's a great question. Um, again, it might be because I was teaching older kids. They, they didn't seem to be um, I was so uptight about... Uh, uh, you know, a, a plant going. Um, it's interesting. I know that I, I'm kind of um, like, I would never harm a slug out in the forest. And we talk all about their fantastic, decom you know, decomposers and their vital part. But we have a swimming pool that we give them swimming lessons with a little bit of soap. So I, I actually, um, we do actively search. Slugging is a job, actually lifting up everything, looking underneath. So I, I'm kind of, I, I don't, I haven't experienced kids in middle school being very upset about the loss of things too much. So I'm sorry, I'm not that, maybe other people have a good experience with that one. Yeah, I'd be keen to share. I mean, I mostly work with littles, littlers. So I think that for me, when like loss happens, I like to really embrace the grief. Like I like to embrace that, like, oh, like there is sadness here. Like let's experience this sadness. But I then think that once there's time in that expression of the feeling it can shift into like oh what did we love about that bean plant like oh look how like caring it was with its tendrils I don't know I think you can like move into the appreciation and it um someone was sharing a story from an outdoor program here in Kamloops that they had like a funeral for something they found they found like a dead bird and so maybe it's a little different if it's like a plant but absolutely I think you could have a funeral for like that sunflower plant like oh but I, and it was just really beautiful they like wrote little notes and messages and then they buried it in like a nice little ritualistic way so my instinct is to like lean into the feeling and then like celebrate it in mm -hmm. like what it gave them but that's just maybe my approach with wee ones um and then Amber can I read yours out loud Amber uh, ever says that they talk about the concept of um, going back to the land and how even when we feel disappointment and sadness that function is still happening and there's important transitions taking place that will nurture other plants soil and animals oh that's beautiful I'm mm -hmm. just going to copy and paste this and put it on a magnet thanks Amber that was beautiful <laughs> um, does anyone else have any other questions or comments before or I ask mine Okay, Laura Lynn, can I ask you a hard question maybe? Okay. Okay, so you have so much experience and I'm wondering in your experience, like lived experience as an educator, have you seen like a transition in like youth's engagement in school garden culture? Like it just in their relationship with our, our gizmos and the way we're interacting in spaces, like have you seen any obvious transition or do you, do you notice any shining light there that like the garden offers? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's true. Um, I actually 
I think it's getting getting worse. I'm I'm actually not not disappointed that I'm uh, have retired, but uh, in a way. Um, and we notice a progression. The grade sixes are still fairly keen and excited about the garden at 11, but by 13, 14, this spring, like between uh, March and and June, the grade eights are checked out. They they want to be in high school. They don't want to be there. They don't want to help. It, you know necessarily too much. I you know in gross generalization. Um, so then we we tried to do things like um, it, remove invasive plants, do the more of the heavy work, schlep more of the wood chips over to where we've got, because I one of those signages in our uh, native plant hedgerow. So doing bigger, heavier things that um, that they can help with, that they're better at. Um, I it it is hard uh, having them just just notice things in the garden. Uh, the chickens help. The garden went from being not cool to once we have the chickens and they could hold chickens. It's called it's the rent a chicken from the Bees Please Farm, and uh, the pack pay for it. And it, it's been uh, just an amazing thing over the last. I think we've had them. It, since 2020, so since uh, the first fall of COVID, we've had them, um, they had come for five months. Uh, it's uh, September, October, and then April, May, and June. So they go they go away back to the 300 chicken, first, you know, chicken farm, and then the chickens come back, the same ones, usually different ones. And it's a little chicken hut uh, that, uh, and so that has made it, they, the kids like that, even the grade eight boys, the coolest kids in the school, you know, holding chickens and sometimes getting pooped on and that's, they're okay with it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's been really fun. <laughs> poop, poop seems to always be just like an engaging topic, no matter the age of, of, of folks. Um, yeah, and no, hold, thanks, Laura Lynn. Yeah. Oh, go holding ahead. a warm egg. It's just mm. amazing. They're like, Oh, it's warm. I'm like, yeah, it just came out of the body. You know, they're and and doing the biology about the eggs. It's it's quite fascinating. I don't think I knew all that before I started teaching it. You know, seconds. Um, okay, and um, I have, there's a comment that uh, Jana is in high school. Our school garden is too small to keep the big kids busy, so we go and work at a neighborhood orchard where we can get help manage the class through community volunteers. If I supervise alone, the kids denew denew. I don't know what that means. The kids do something to plants in two minutes. If I'm not... Oh, do you... Do you... oh do you... <laughs> yeah. If I'm not watching, it's true. But like what I love there is you're really looping in those community volunteers. That's so nice. Um, yeah. I was having a conversation today at a school about engaging community volunteers and, and families and, and retired folks. So that's, that's really nice that you can share that Jenna. Um, yeah. Uh, Tessa, do you have any other questions or comments before we yeah. wrap up? Just speaking of community volunteers, Laura Lynn, I feel like you've done an incredible job weaving a network of folks engaged in the garden around you, the master gardeners, the seniors, parents. Do you have any tips or tricks of how you were able to create um, such a community around the garden and also just the benefiting from that support of having so many volunteers and making that worth your work and supporting those volunteers and training volunteers and getting out in the garden? So just curious a little bit more about that journey and any tips for those folks that are looking to engage more volunteers in their garden. The master gardeners actually have a mandate to volunteer. So if, um, and it would be interesting, it would be really wonderful if there was sort of a network of of linking a master gardener to every school that had a garden, uh, you know, in their in their community or kind of close to. Um, I know that Paula McCormick at the uh, Horticulture Center of the Pacific was looking into trying to get something like that, certainly in, in the Victoria area, um, but, I, and I should talk to her more about it because it, it is a provincial, you know, network and there's, you know, so it, that, that is, that's a really good resource. I don't know, maybe Marcus knows a little bit more about that um, or anything that is going on that way, but it, they, they, they do need to volunteer and, uh, uh, and even people taking their master gardener uh, certification need to volunteer. So that might be a way um, to have people get and also seniors homes like um the the not the the ones that are kind of independent living they usually have a bus and those and they're looking for activities for people to do and they could bus them to you i i, I wanted to and and, and it, but you have to it, it's hard because you have then you have to manage those volunteers you have to have things for them to do and 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 work it all out but i i do think that even if they only came twice a a, a month that it would be uh, kind of a good thing so i'm 
look going to look into that a little bit further for Coquits. Yeah. Thanks, Laurelyn. I sense that you have this wonderful balance of being able to create an openness to invite folks in while still having a very productive garden. I find sometimes I can see that as either or, like either I have a learning space where it's a bit of a free for all and everyone's welcome versus I have a, like my rows and my seeds and it's all in order. And I feel like you strike this balance of still having a lot to harvest from that garden, a lot growing in that garden, but um, you have a way that welcomes people in and is not too fastidious that everything has to be done just a certain way such that students can feel a place in there and students can feel part of that space as well as volunteers that come in. Um, and I really, yeah, I have a lot to learn and admire that balance you seem to hold. Thank you. We have two more minutes if there's any last question. Um, otherwise we can wrap up there. Well, I went, might invite uh, Leslie Roberts there, who's uh, maybe she's behind that photo. Um, she's been volunteering for, I guess if the garden's been going nine years, she's been volunteering for five or six <laughs> or seven. Yeah. Or whatever. yeah. Good presentation, Laurelyn. Thanks. But do you have anything to add as a volunteer, a long-term volunteer? Well, I'm pretty passionate about, my background is chiropractic and, um, and nutrition and a pediatric chiropractor. So, um, you know, food is medicine, food is medicine, food is medicine. And, um, so I'm really passionate about educating uh, youth about that. And that always drops in, in any conversation, in most of the conversations I have with kids. So, um, you know, that is my one thing within this whole uh, community is to educate kids about that because it's really important for the future of our healthcare system and of our food security system and of our planet. Yeah. Thanks. So, so get, so get, look for people who are into nutrition. <laughs> Marcus, I see your hand up. I know we're almost at time. Just wanted to jump in and say uh, thanks, Laura Lynn, for joining us and just to maybe give your flowers to uh, flowers over to you as well. I got to travel around um, looking uh, at a lot of the salad bar programs that were being run for a number of years. Um, and uh, Colquitt's ran probably the most incredible salad bar, a lunch program that I saw while traveling around the province. I saw about 15 or 20 different programs. And I know that you're not getting into that really here. It's mostly focusing on the guard, but it was really, truly inspiring. So I just wanted to kind of bring that up because uh, you've made big connections between those two things and it was admirable. Thank you. Yeah, we, we didn't actually call it a salad bar. They're like, well, wait a minute, there's stir fry and there's there's a crisp and there's soup and there's, yeah, so we just called it a farm to school lunch, but yes, yeah, was, yeah. hopefully again, sometime. Yeah, Laurelyn, sounds like we need to have you back for another topic, but thank you for today yeah. focusing on the spring planting as we're all eager to get out there with our students. Um, so thank you everyone too for taking this break from your afternoon for joining us today. Just a reminder to head on over to the program library. You'll see our slide deck a recording of this webinar, and then also um, a document that has all the links that we've put in the chat bar, as well as some additional resources that are relevant to the topic today. Um, so you can revisit uh, these and think about it in context of your own school garden. So again, yeah, thank you all for being here. It's lovely to see you, and we'll see you folks in May for our workshop on summer maintenance and engaging volunteers. Have a wonderful afternoon.